everyone. I'm here to talk to you about three scary alphabets, GMO, genetically modified organisms. Where would you go if you want more information on GMOs? Of course, Dr. Google, the know-it-all professor. I tried doing the same thing, and here's what I got. I found that Dr. Google's space was crowded with dubious, horror stories and images of GMOs. So my talk today is to go past the rhetoric, create an understanding of the science and facts behind GMOs, and enable us to make an informed decision. But before I do that, let me walk you through the history of crop modification. Genetic modification of our food is not new. It started when men started domesticating plants. They selected the best seeds and crossed them with wild varieties to get better yield, better traits. But we often think that whatever we eat today are natural food. Let me now show you some examples of real, natural, original food. Here is a real banana. It is full of seeds, making it very difficult to eat. In the commercial variety that we eat today, the number of chromosomes have been changed. Here is the real carrot. It is just mere roots and no tubers. And the other one is the original corn. The kernels do not look palatable and crunchy. And judging from the size, you may wonder if this corn will be able to feed the entire global livestock and poultry industry. They're called theosinte. Where do you think we got our cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts from? It is from this weed looking plant. And if you think kiwi fruit originated from New Zealand, I'm sorry to tell you that you're wrong. It is from this plant called Chinese gooseberry from China. So can you imagine from all these ancestral plants to the commercially available plants that we eat today, how much of gene scrambling have taken place? How much of genetic modification have taken place? But we think they are not genetically modified, although they are crossed with wild varieties. Now you may say that they are still natural because they are crossed with wild varieties. But crossing with wild varieties alone is not the only method to make new crop cultivars. There are other methods. One is producing mutant crops. Can you imagine that we are eating mutant crops? How do you produce mutant crops? By exposing the plants to chemicals. Gene scrambling takes place, genetic modification takes place, although we don't consider them to be GM food. Another method of producing mutant plant is by exposing the plants to radiation, gamma radiation. Gene scrambling takes place, but we still do not consider them to be GM food. What are the mutant crops that we eat on almost a daily basis? Rice, wheat, sesame, barley, sorghum, sunflower, grapefruits, pears, peas, peanuts, peppermint, tapioca. According to FAA rec records in Vienna, 2,965 mutant crops have been released into the market in the last 40 years. There is yet another method to produce new crop cultivars that is by changing the number of times a chromosome appears in a plant cell. In a haploid plant, a chromosome only appears once in its plant cells. In a diploid plant, a chromosome appears twice in the plant cells. And in a polyploid plant, the same chromosome appears more than twice in the plant cells. So a haploid plant can be converted to a diploid and a diploid to a polyploid. Yet, it's not considered to be GM food or crops. One example of a food that we eat produced through this method is watermelon. So what is a GM food then? There's one difference between all this conventional method and GM food. All these conventional method do not require any safety testing, safety towards animals, human beings and environment 
before they are released into the market. They can be released into the market as soon as the breeder, farmers or scientists find out that a useful trait has emerged. They don't need any approval process, unlike GM crops that require stringent regulatory approval and it goes to stringent testing. So what is a GM crop then? When you find a useful gene in a plant that's not related to the plant that you want to transform, or when you find a useful gene in an, any organism that you want to splice that gene and put it into the plant, the plant now becomes GM crop. Examples are Bt corn, Bt cotton, Bt canola, Bt brinjal. Why Bt? Because the gene now comes from a soil bacterium called Bacillus thuringiensis. It is a common soil bacteria commonly used in organic farming as biopesticide. This bacteria has a gene that produces a protein that can kill corn pest, cotton pest and brinjal pest. So when you take this gene and splice it and put only this gene into corn, cotton, brinjal, the plant now produces the same protein. And when this pest comes to eat the plant, the pest die immediately without causing further damage to the plant. It is like we getting vaccinated against TB, polio. I do not have to take medicines every day to keep away from these diseases because our body has inbuilt immunity against these diseases. The same with insect resistant crops. Farmers do not have to spray pesticides because these plants have inbuilt resistance. Genetic modification of plant is actually an extension of plant breeding, but they provide additional precision, flexibility and speed. Precision, because now only that particular gene is transferred into the plant. There's no gene scrambling. Flexibility, because now the gene of interest can be sourced from any organisms not related to the same taxonomy group, not limited to the plant that's related to the plant that you want to transform. So this is a big benefit because now if you can't find the gene of interest in the same taxonomical group, you can't do conventional breeding. We all know and an apple and an orange cannot be crossed. So you need to work at the gene level. It gives speed because now we do not have to wait for so many generations before the gene of interest is successfully transferred into the plant. Besides insect resistant crops, there are other crops in the market. For example, herbicide tolerant crops, where farmers will be able to spray chemicals and these chemicals will only kill the wheat, not the crops. A very big benefit to farmers because now farmers do not have to do manual weeding. It saves time and cost on the farmer's part. Crops that are tolerant to drought, resilient in the face of climate change, again, a useful trait and we all know this year even farmers in Malaysia was not spared. Crops that can be fortified with additional nutrients like vitamins and minerals. A useful trait for poor people in developing countries. These crops provide agronomic, economic, environmental and social benefits to farmers. 18 million farmers in 28 countries grow GM crops on 179.7 million hectares of land. These farmers are business people. You can cheat these farmers in one season, but not in the next one, because they will only buy the same seeds if it brings benefits to them. And the economic gain enjoyed by these farmers is equivalent to 150 billion US dollars from 1996 to 2014. And because of insect resistant crops. Farmers now do not use so much of pesticides. So the use of pesticides is reduced by 583.5 million kilograms between 1996 to 2014. And because farmers do not use so much of chemicals in, the, in their farms, they do not have to spray these chemicals. And because of that, they do not have to use fuel to do the spraying. So less carbon dioxide is released into the environment. And this is equivalent to removing 12 million cars off the road for one year. And 16.2 million farmers have benefited 
from this technology. The source poor farmers in developing countries have benefited from this technology, successfully alleviated from poverty. So with all these benefits, why the public outcry? There are valid concerns such, like, such as food safety, environmental impact, and trade monopoly. But these concerns have been addressed with so much of scientific information and data. Let me just go through this briefly one by one. Food safety. More than 2,000 scientific studies conducted confirms that GM crops and foods do not pose any ill effect. More than 250 scientific organizations around the world endorse GM crops as safe. 70 to 90% of our food producing animals, chicken, cattle, goats, sheep and pigs, consume meals made of GM ingredients. In the last 20 years, 1 trillion meals have been prepared using GM ingredients and not a single health hazard has been reported. As for environmental impact, GM technology is a land saving technology, it's a green technology because farmers can produce more yield in the same land area. And because of this, farmers do not have to open new forest areas for agriculture, a big boon to conservation of biodiversity. Because of insect resistant crops, farmers do not spray so much of chemicals, less carbon dioxide is released, and this mitigates climate change. There might be valid concern of pollen flow from GM crops to non-GM crops, but this is mitigated with proper product stewardship in the farming. And there might be also another concern where pests build up resistance towards the protein that is produced by the crop. And this is not the problem only with GM crops. If farmers spray chemicals, the pest can also build up resistance towards the chemicals. And again, this is mitigated with proper product stewardship in the farm. And companies that produce GM seeds are always training and educating farmers on best practices in farming, just like when they use any other tools and chemicals in agriculture. As for trade monopoly, Farmers around the world have been buying patented hybrid seeds since 1930s. And since then, most of these farmers are not saving seeds. In fact, seed saving is not the best agronomic practice because these seeds will lose their genetic vigor from one generation to the next, affecting yield and quality of the produce. In fact, do you know who actually encourages trade monopoly? It is us when our demand for very stringent regulatory process is there, when we demand for luxurious information that's not really necessary to determine the safety of GM crops. And when we do this, only big companies with deep pocket will be able to conduct all this testing because it requires millions of dollars to do the testing. So what are we doing? We are pushing the technology to the hands of the big boys in the industry. Farmers are business people, as I said, and you can't force them to choose organic, hybrid seeds, integrated farming, or GM seeds. It's their call. There are dozens of GM research in public sector in developing countries, like in China, India, Argentina, and Brazil. And if our demand for this stringent regulatory process is there, this research will not see the light of the day. So with all these things, why the public outcry again? This is because there are a lot of propaganda that is spread by activists. Former US president once said, Dwight Eisenhower, he said, farming is a mighty easy task if you live thousands of miles away from cornfield and your plow is a pencil. This relates very well to those who create the propaganda, scaremongering tactics and misinformation about GM crops because they're completely disconnected from the farming community. They have vested interest. They are made up of activists who are oblivious to scientific information and they are funded by industry that might lose out if GM crops become mainstream, like the organic industry. These armchair critics have the best tools to do their job, the best computers, the best laptops, the best smartphones, but they deprive farmers of the best technology to help 
keep farming sustainable healthy and profitable have a look at this image it was taken by my colleague outside an organic shop in a shopping complex in Kuala Lumpur the wooden panels have tomatoes hanging on it and it reads do you know that the delicious tomatoes on your plate are inserted with spider silk spider gene so that the evil corporation can extract the silk and make billions of dollars now think carefully if it is true that these tomatoes really have spider silk won't the companies harvest them and send it to their factories and extract the silk now what is left in a tomato after the silk is extracted will it be able to enter the market and end up on your dinner plate so we all know that it is blatant lies scaremongering tactics and unethical communication practice at the back of the wooden panel are brinjols and it reads do you know that frog genes are inserted into your brinjol so that they have unusually broad spectrum monstrous power to resist various infections the only gm brinjol in the world is bt brinjol and as i've said bt because the gene comes from bacillus thuringiensis a bacteria not frog gene and it is only grown in bangladesh for now and if it is really true that these frogs have this monstrous power to resist various infection won't all the pharmaceutical companies go after the frogs there are billions of dollars to be made so again blatant lies scaremongering tactics and unethical communication practice have a look at this image and think which culture in the world condones vandalism this activist probably enters the field farms only when they want to destroy field trials not to bring innovation to the farmers not to talk to the farmers about the challenges they face in farming not to address the farmers problems this activist destroy years of research data information public funding and more importantly farmers hope for a better future lastly i want to say that gm technology is not a silver bullet it's not a panacea but it is a powerful technology that should be used in combination with all the existing conventional method because this technology will enable us to develop crops that can feed, feed the world crops that can be resilient in the face of climate change crops that can mitigate agriculture footprint crops that can be fortified with additional nutrients crops that can enable us to intensify agriculture sustainably i am a mother of two teenage daughters and i'll be very happy to feed my children and my family with gm food anytime without any doubt the jury is out you decide which are the seeds of destruction gm seeds or those who create the propaganda and scaremongering tactics and deprive the farmers and our future generation of a useful powerful technology that can help us to keep the planet green and help us to feed the world thank you very much